Baruch Atah Eredan, Eloheinu Melech HaOlam, Anu Madlekim Nerot Shal Shabbat B'Shem Yeshua HaMashiach, Sa Shalom O HaOlam. Next slide. All the women together with us, blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe. We light the Shabbat lights in the name of Yeshua the Messiah. Prince of Peace, Light of the World, Amen. And next slide, thanks. And again, Heavenly Father, bless us with your presence, enlighten our eyes with your light and your truth, just as we light the Shabbat candles before you, and so make a spirit of trust and love dwell in our homes and in community. We praise you for the gift of your Son, Yeshua. He has come to bless the whole world be a light to the nations. Amen. Shabbat shalom, everybody, and welcome. It's lovely to see you here. Thank you for coming. Enjoy your evening. It's clear that neither I nor Cameron have the magnetic touch or the magic touch, as we are unable to move the slide. Can I ask for the children to come in? Okay. If you, you know it, say it with me. Yeah, otherwise the English is also good. Thank you. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech ha'alam borei pri ha'kafen. Amen. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who creates the fruit of the vine. Amen. Next slide. Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of the universe, who has sanctified us in your word and who has taken pleasure in us and in love and in mercy has granted us the Shabbat. A reminder regarding creation. It is the first amongst our days of sacred assembly. Recalling the exodus from Egypt, you've chosen us and sanctified us from amongst all peoples and in love you've granted us your Shabbat. Blessed are you, O Lord, who sanctifies the Shabbat. Next slide. <laughs> and if you wouldn't mind saying uh, this with us together, Baruch Atah Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam HaMotze Lechem Min Haaretz. Amen. Amen. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King, King of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. Amen. Amen. Next slide. We're going to ask the children to come forward. I need a couple of volunteers and brain volunteers. Yeah. You said you'd come. <laughs> and you volunteered. I did. <laughs> so I think there's. Um, yeah, would you mind? Okay. So would you mind uh, stretching your hands out, uh, your kids and your grandkids, because this is what we're praying for. I'm speaking for these children and say the blessing of the children with me. May the Lord make you like Ephraim and Manasseh. May the Lord make you like Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, and Leah. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace through our Messiah. Um, as you notice there, uh, we have the privilege in early September to have uh, Dr. Baruch Korman speaking here in Chatswood. These registrations are filling up very fast. Please, um, you're obviously welcome to look at our website, um, looking at One for Israel's website, looking uh, at Alex. Derek Prince's ministry's <laughs> website. If you want more information on this discussion, uh, Christian, Margarita, and Alex are, are here tonight. 
please uh, talk to him or talk to them. Uh, but please don't miss this. This is one of the top teachers in the Messianic world and an absolute gem to listen to. So please, um, obviously, this applies to all of us. This applies to your churches. Uh, if you'd like to uh, get flyers, uh, Alex has some um, that, that can be posted to you uh, instantaneously. Well, fantastic, Good Alex. Good on you. Good on you. <laughs> okay, well, I guess we're on the next slide. Okay, they're ready? Mm -hmm. Yep. I'm assuming correctly um, that all of you would have your Bibles with you, whether electronically. Um, I'm just going to read Psalm 71, which is what uh, Daryl will be talking to us about. So would you kindly open your Bibles and I will read. <coughs> In you, O Lord, I have taken refuge. Let me never be ashamed. In your righteousness, deliver me and rescue me. Incline your ear to me and save me. Be to me a rock of habitation to which I may continually come. You have given command to save me, for you are my rock and my fortress. Rescue me, O God, out of the hand of the wicked, out of the grasp of the wrongdoer and ruthless men. For you are my hope, O Lord. God, you are my confidence from my youth. By you I have been sustained from my birth. Gee, this is positive. You are he who took me from my mother's womb. My praise is continuously to you. I've become a marvel to many, for you are my strong refuge. My mouth is filled with your praise and with your glory all day long. Do not cast me off in time of old age. Do not forsake me with my strength when my strength fails. For my enemies have spoken against me, and those who watch for my life have consulted together, saying God has forsaken him. Pursue and seize him, for there is no one to deliver. O God, 
do not be far from me. O oh my God, hasten to my help. Let those who are adversaries of my soul be shamed and consumed. Let them be covered with reproach and dishonor who seek to injure me. But as for me, I will hope continually and I will praise you yet more and more. My mouth shall tell of your righteousness and of your salvation all day long. For I do not know the sum of them. I will come with the mighty deeds of the Lord God. I will make mention of your righteousness, yours alone. O oh God, you have taught me from my youth and still declare your wondrous deeds. And even when I'm old and gray, O oh God, do not forsake me until I declare your strength to this generation, your power to all who are to come. For your righteousness, O oh God, reaches to the heavens. You have done great things, O oh God, who is like you who have shown me many troubles and distresses, will revive me again and will bring me up again from the depths of the earth. May you increase my greatness and turn to comfort me. I will also praise you with a harp, even your truth, O oh my God. To you I will sing praises with a lyre. O oh, Holy One of Israel, my lips will shout for joy when I sing praises to you. And my soul, which you have redeemed, my tongue, also will utter your righteousness all day long. For they are ashamed, for they are humili humiliated for seeking my hurt. Daryl, would you mind joining me here, please? It's a great privilege to introduce to those of you that weren't here this afternoon, a friend, a scholar, an author, and a tutor, and many more things, but most of all, a man that truthfully knows God yes. as his Lord and Savior. Yes. Welcome here. Enjoy the evening. We will certainly enjoy your talk. Yeah. Thank you. Thank Over you. to you. Thank you, Harry. Really appreciate it. Um, howdy, y'all. <laughs> Greetings from Texas. Okay, where I'm from. Uh, anyway, uh, it's a real privilege to be here in Sydney and to be with you all, um, or you all as we like to say, and uh, it's, it's a privilege. So let me open this up in a word of prayer. We'll begin. Father, we do thank you for this time to be together to open your word and to be reminded of your goodness and grace. And so we pause in the midst of the end of a long week and we sit before you and we rejoice in your presence, we rest in your grace, we celebrate your forgiveness, and we are immersed in your life. We ask you that you would uh, sustain us in the time that lies ahead as we open your word, and that as we do so, we might have a sense of uh, all that you have done for us, and the ways in which, the many ways in which you enrich our lives. We ask your blessing on our time now, we ask these things in the name of Yeshua, our Messiah. Amen. Well, it's a real pleasure to be with you. Um, and in case you can't tell, I'm old. Uh, um, I worked hard for this gray hair. I don't know who to blame for it. I certainly won't blame my wife. That won't be good when I go home. Okay. I can't blame my kids. Uh, they've been long gone and uh, I've gotten grayer since they left, so I'm old. Uh, and uh, I'm looking at a psalm that I've entitled A Psalm from Opa. Now, I don't know if you know what an Opa is, okay? Some of you will, some of you might not, but um, there are a variety of names that, that people who are grandparents get called when they're old. Uh, and uh, hopefully names of affection, sometimes you never know, and, uh, and so the name that I have as the grandfather in our household is the name Opa. So I've entitled this a psalm from Opa. It is written by an old saint who at the end of his life or near the end of his life has turned his attention to thinking back on kind of where he is, what he has faced, what he is facing, what lies ahead. 
and he's thinking about what that might be. What's interesting is, other than that, we know next to nothing about the setting of this song. It, it kind of lands in no man, Opa land, okay? Uh, we don't know where it fits exactly, etc. But the one thing we do know is this is an old man making a request to God. And so these are almost like, um, now I'm not hopefully not this old, but these are almost like a, a, a parting word from a patriarch and a family. And so I think it's interesting to think about the context of this psalm in which it appears and to realize here's someone who's had a lifelong experience with his God who's summarizing that experience and trying to say by its placement in a psalter, which someone else was responsible for, um, that this is the way we ought to reflect on who God is. What better way to do that at the end of a week in a, in a Shabbat service than to do that. So I'm going to walk us through the psalm. I'm going to go verse by verse. Uh, and I've divided it into various parts. And we'll try and, and work through this a piece at a time. And I'll be making observations as we go along. So if you have, oh, oh there's something else I'd love to do. Um, so first, how many, of you who brought a, how many of you brought a Bible that has what we call pages in it? Okay. <laughs> All right. Oh, if you brought a Bible with pages in it, hold it up nice and nice and high, nice and proud. There you are. Okay. Everyone knows who's got the Bible with pages. How many of you brought your Bible in a device? Okay. Hold it up, vice, nice and proud. All right. Now I'm gonna I'm gonna appeal for a moment of reconciliation after the service. Those of you who have page Bibles, talk with someone who has a device Bible, and remember there is no. Bible or device in Christ, we're all one. Okay? So, which me now means that I'm... You, uh, yeah. <laughs> it's recommended. There you go. All right. So, um, so, um, so now what I mean, you either turn to Psalm 71 or you swipe to Psalm 71. Take your choice. Okay? And we're going to start off with the first three verses. And I will read them and then comment. So it says... Um, Make sure I start, I'm starting Psalm 70. That won't do us any good. Psalm 71. In you, O Lord, do I take refuge. Never let me be put to shame. In your righteousness, deliver me and rescue me. Incline your ear to me. Save me. Be to me a rock of refuge to which I may continually come. You have given the command to save me, for you are my rock and my fortress. Here's an old man uh, in the last stages of his life, looking back on where he sits before God, and even late in life, with all that life experience, he still needs his Lord. He still needs to interact with and depend on God. And you'll notice all the words of, how can I say this, of comfort and, uh, and refuge that are in the verse. In verse 1, in you, O Lord, do I take my refuge. Uh, in verse 3, be to me a rock of refuge. And the picture in the first verse is a refuge is something that covers you, that protects you because it covers you. In the, thir in the third verse, it's a refuge that's up on a hill that protects you because you're high up and lifted up away from your enemies. To which I continually come. You have given the command to save me, for you are my rock and my fortress. And really, from the very first note of this psalm all the way through, we're going to see someone who is resting and relying on their relationship with God almost despite the swirl that may be going on around him. I think it's an important idea and thought for us today. When we look at the world and what we go through, when we think about what we've been through in the last several years, um, when we think about, you know, having gone through the pandemic, which we're actually not through yet, I often ask people, you know, they ask me, what is a post-COVID world going to be like? And I go, I don't know about you, but I haven't seen the post yet. <laughs> so, um, so we're going through COVID, we, you know, we're going through a major conflict in Europe that we haven't seen in a long time in the world. The impact of that is having global ramifications. There's just a lot swirling around us. If I could come more local and we think about oftentimes what Christians go through because of the way they represent the Lord and the culture, there's a swirl around us. 
And so the question becomes, how do I live in the midst of the swirl? How do I live in the middle of the tempest, if you will, as the hurricane rotates with its eye around uh, where we are and where we find ourselves? And what the psalmist is saying in the beginning of his message is, I will find my protection, I will find my cover, I will find my being lifted up in my relationship to you. And so he asks in a call out to God for God to hear his request and to protect him. And so those are the first three verses of the psalm. It's a call to God to listen. And then in verse 4, we get the request put forward to the God. Rescue me, my, oh my God, from the hand of the wicked, from the grasp of the unjust and cruel man. For you, O oh Lord, are my hope, my trust, O oh Lord, from my youth. He is relying on a couple of things. One, that God will eventually, one day, vindicate the righteous. And he's making an appeal that that vindication, that rescue, is something that he can appeal to and for. But the second thing that he's saying is, is that I have built this understanding of this trust because you have been with me since my youth. And we'll see how young he's talking about in a minute. But you've been with me from, uh, from my youth, and you are my hope. You know, we use the word hope in a variety of ways. You know, I hope the weather will be nice tomorrow. My understanding is, is that I've arrived in kind of a really nice period in Sydney weather that you all had uh, gotten to the point where you were lacking hope about what the weather was going to be like in Sydney, and you wanted to know if you could call Noah's relatives, okay, <laughs> for relief because of all how wet it's been here. Um, I've only heard about it, but it obviously registered because virtually every place I've visited, I've heard about this, uh, the kind of weather that you've been having recently. Uh, you know, I hope it'll be a nice day. That, that's, that's, an, that's an expectation that you don't know is going to deliver. This hope's different. For you, O oh Lord, are my hope. This is a hope that you know is going to deliver. It's an expectation that you, you know, flip a coin. Maybe it'll happen, maybe it won't. No, it's an expectation that you know is going to take place. It's part of where you get your security from. It means that in the midst of the swirl and in the midst of the tempest and in the midst of the chaos and in the midst of the disruption, there's peace. There's shalom. Upon you I have leaned from before my birth you are he who took me from my mother's womb. My praise is continually of you. He has a record with God. That record with God goes back not just to what he's speaking now when he's writing the psalm, but it goes back to the very beginning of his life. He knows that God has been with him from the very beginning, from the moment of his birth, even to some degree before the time when he was born. And this praise of this presence of God throughout his life is his reminder that he can be secure. And so he rests in that. So the request is that there is an expectation that is a source of optimism and it's a source of peace for him in the midst of the disruption of what comes around. The verse in verse 4 is an interesting verse. It says, rescue me from the hand of the wicked, from the grasp of the, of the unjust and cruel man. The deliver from the hand of the, of the wicked and the use of the unjust flat, flat hand of the oppressor, the cruel man is the oppressor. The, it's two pictures. It's power exercised against me on the one hand, and it's the back slap of an insult on the other. That's the picture in the verse. And so the request is to be rescued from that which he may well face because he has trusted in the Lord from his youth. And when he says that he has leaned upon him from beginning of birth, the one who took me from his womb, he's expressing a dependence. A dependence that he is now reaffirming light in his life as something that he's been doing all through his life. 
and the character of this opa, of this old man, turning to God yet again because he understands that the only way to have peace in the midst of the disruptions of life is dependent on the God who cares for him. And so it results in praise because he knows the record of the caring God who has interacted with him in his life. That brings us very quickly to verses 7 through 11, which give his current situation, which isn't very different from what he's been talking about. I have been, I have been as a portent to many, is the way my translation reads, a sign to many. It's a, a portent and a sign means there's something negative going on here. It isn't necessarily a positive but you are my strong refuge. This is what's going on. I'm seen this way by the world. That's the lens of the way they see me. But you are my strong refuge. I will rest in you. My mouth is filled with your play, praise and with your glory all the day. Do not cast me off in the time of old age. It's an appeal to say the way you have sustained me through life is the way I need to be sustained in my old age. It's another way of saying, may your consistency stay with me in the consistency of your care. Forsake me not when my strength is spent. For my enemies, this is why you know that this scene, this section is negative. For my enemies speak concerning me. You might hear it this way. For my enemies plot against me. Ooh. Do, 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 do. My enemies speak concerning me. They gather around concerning me. Those who watch for my life consult together. Wow, well, there's whispering going on in the back room. There's something going on about that guy. We need to stop him or do something or push him or whatever. You get what I'm talking about. Here's what they say. God has forsaken him. Pursue and seize him. There is none to deliver him. You're all alone. You are all alone. You should fear us. Because there's no one to protect you. And that, as the psalm makes clear, is a lie. So we turn to the request restated, given this being the situation in verse 12. O oh God, be not far from me. O oh my God, make haste to help me. May my accusers be put to shame and consumed with scorn and disgrace. May they be covered, uh, may they be covered who seek my hurt. He makes an appeal to justice. He does not take justice into his own hands. He trusts that justice is something that God will execute for him. That God will not only rescue him, but that God will ultimately deliver him to the shalom that is the hope that he has. So as the situation swirls and as he's in the middle of the tempest and as he seeks the peace that only the covering and protection from God, the fortress that is God, can give, as people plot against him, and as the pressure rises, and as he seeks for his own vindication, he doesn't seek his own vindication by his own strength. But he rests in the vindication that ultimately comes from God. And his hope is not only of the protection that God can give, but of the vindication that God will give one day. In God's way. In God's timing in God's program and plan. And then, assuming that that request is going to be answered, he affirms his commitment because he believes God will respond. That's verse 14. But I will hope continually and will praise you yet more and more my mouth will tell of your righteous acts, of your deeds of salvation all the day, for their number is past my knowledge. That's a way of saying, what you do to sustain me and to save me is a list without end. 
It's like the ending of the Gospel of John, where John says, I could write a lot more about what it is that Yeshua did and said, but there is not a library big enough to contain everything that has been done by God on people's behalf. Verse 16, with the mighty deeds of the Lord I will come. I will remind them of your righteousness, yours alone. When the swirl happens, when the pressure comes, we do not need to be defensive about who we are or lift up who we are. We are to focus on who he is and what he has done. Oh God, from my youth you have taught me and I still proclaim your wondrous deeds. This is the appeal again to the consistency of the relationship that he has as he looks back on him and the way God has treated him. Even in the midst of the swirl, even in the midst of the pressure, even in the midst of the disruption that people have tried to bring in his life. Even in all that noise and static. There's a peace that comes with knowing that God has your back. So even to old age and gray hairs, I'm very sensitive about this verse. <laughs> oh God, do not forsake me until I proclaim your might to another generation, your power to all those to come. This is actually why I wanted to share this psalm. Because we have a legacy that we're supposed to leave to a younger generation. There is an experience with God that is being expressed here that is to be passed on. There is a reality of what it means to be connected and related to God in the consistency of what he has done for us already, setting up the consistency of what he will do for us one day into which we are to rest. And we are to pass that legacy on to a younger generation. Um, Last year, I got a chance to preach this passage in my home church where my grandkids are present. And I actually had them help me with the service. What we did is we built, we built a little tent off to the side, just like you would build a tent in your living room for your kids, you know, when they were young, that kind of thing. And you, you'd play, you know, camp out in the living room and that kind of thing. It was a refuge. It was a picture of God being a refuge. And I had them build it at the start, and then I had them come out at the end, sit there, and I brought a torch to them, much like these candles. And I took the torch at the end of the message and passed it on to them. And I said, I'm passing the torch as a legacy of what it means to know God to you. One of the messages that's coming from OPA is there's a responsibility of older people in a congregation to pass on what they know about their walk with God to younger people so that they will be able to appreciate and grasp what it is and who it is, what God has done and who it is that God is. One way to know whether your congregation is effective in what it is that they are doing is by the way in which the legacy is passed on to younger people. And so the effort to mentor younger people, to encourage them, to rally around them, to be supportive of them, to help them learn the lessons that this Opa learned when he was young, that God is with us and will not abandon us, that he is the refuge, that he is the hope, is part of what the calling of a community should be before the Lord. So his commitment is to praise God, to talk about his justice, to talk about his righteousness, to proclaim the salvation and deliverance that comes through God. In our context, it's about the offer of the forgiveness of sins that we have. It's about the reconnection and restoration of people who are separated from God, reconnected to why they live and who they are made in, in the image of God. It's the reconnection of the idea that we were made, male and female in the image of God, to work together to live together, to flourish together, to collaborate together that made the creation go from good to very good. I like to tell people 
Creation did not get its promotion until the woman was created alongside the man and they were designed to help one another. <laughs> I mean, think about it. This is the way the text portrays it. All the other elements of the creation were paraded before Adam, one at a time. And here was his reaction. Nope. 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 The bear, the dog, the cat, the bird. Nope. 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 Then Eve was presented to Adam. And he went, whoa! God was good in how he made us to be designed for relationship with him and relationship with one another so that we would steward the creation well. That was our assignment in Genesis 1. I won't ask how we're doing. But that was the assignment. And God's work of salvation and restoration is designed to allow us to be equipped to go back to where we started. I often talk about going back to the future. That's part of what salvation is. And God's righteousness did it in such a way that even though I fell short and you fell short, God didn't fall short. He didn't fall short because of who the Savior was. That is worth reflecting on and repeating. Being the objects of God's grace, we should be gracious. Being the object of God's love, we should be loving. And that's what this passage is calling for. And there's a, there's a humility in all of this that recognizes that I am not who I am because of who I am. I am who I am because of who he is. And I never forget it. When I'm dealing with someone who's pushing against me, when, my, when their back is turned to God and I think, oh, they're in rebellion and it's tough, it's true. I need to be reminded that God tapped me on the shoulder when my back was turned. And my calling is to mirror and imitate my God. So I will praise his righteousness. I will praise the way he set it up. I will emphasize the fact that God is an equal opportunity employer. He makes available his salvation and his grace to anyone who embraces it, but it only benefits the person who takes advantage of it. So I will speak of the mighty acts, verse 16 says. I will speak of the mighty deeds of the Lord our God. I will remind them of your righteousness and yours alone, not mine. O oh God, from my youth you have taught me and I still proclaim all your wondrous deeds. So even to my old age, O oh God, do not forsake me until I proclaim your might to another generation and your power to all those to come. The legacy, the assignment. The assignment is to pass it on. Continues. Your righteousness, O oh God, in verse 19, reaches the high heavens. You have done great things, O oh God, who is like you? You know, sometimes the Bible asks a question, you just go, that's a good question. Who is like you? No one even comes close. You have made me see many troubles and calamities. You who have made me see many troubles and calamities will revive me again. There's nothing in this psalm that says, I am given an immunity pill from all trouble. I am in the midst and live in a fallen world, but no fallenness will ever touch me. No, that's not the promise of the scripture. The promise of the scripture is, in the midst of the swirl, in the midst of the tempest, God will be my refuge. God will be my strength. You have made me see many troubles and calamities, you will revive me again. From the depths of the earth, you will bring me up again. In the midst of the swirl, which he describes as being in the depths of the earth, being as low as it can go, you will lift me up to a high place and give me protection. Our ultimate comfort in the chaos is knowing who God is and what he will do. 
You're in unique hands when you're in the hands of the Almighty God. Um, on Sunday, I'm going to get the privilege of preaching at St. Andrew's Cathedral. When I was given a tour of the church yesterday by one of the people on the staff, and we were just debriefing on what would happen on Sunday, which uh, as an American became very clear to me at this church that one thing that I need to do is have a coat and tie when I preach, which is not normally the case for me as an American. And so, um, so I'm sitting there going, did I bring a coat and tie with me? And I know I brought a tie. I'm not sure I brought a coat. But my wife, she rescued the perishing. She put a suit coat in the bottom of my suitcase. So when I mentioned this to her, she said, you have a coat because I always think you never know. OK? <laughs> but my point here is, you're in unique hands with God. He cares for you even sometimes when you don't even know it. And I think about being at that church and, you know, it, when, you, when you go to a church that has that kind of heritage behind it, you know, there's a little bit of, um, I was going to call it pride, but I'm trying to think what other word I can use. There's a little bit of, um, well, that, there's a good Hebrew term, a good bit of chutzpah, okay, that comes with, with that kind of, you know, this is the church where the royals come when they come to Australia and in fact you go up one of the staircases and lo and behold there's a portrait of Queen Elizabeth okay she's your queen not mine okay <laughs> all right there's a portrait of Queen Elizabeth and the next one it's Elizabeth and and Prince Philip and it's signed etc and I'm going you know I'm not preaching at the normal church that I normally preach at this Sunday And so I posted this on Facebook, you know, about I was preaching Sunday at this church, and I showed a picture of the church, and I showed a picture of the organ, which is absolutely stunning in the building. And someone wrote me in the comments, okay? It's, you know, you post on Facebook, you will get a response. <laughs> and said, isn't it great to be preaching in the church where we are all royals. I thought, man, that is right on. What a comment. You cannot be in any better set of unique, unique hands. You cannot be more better networked than being in the hiding place that God has provided. And that brings comfort in the midst of the chaos. That's where, in the midst of the pressure, the peace can emerge. You will increase my greatness and comfort me again, says verse 21. He is so certain of the relationship that he has had with God and the way in which God has sustained him that even though he doesn't know the detail of the future and what it will bring, and in the midst of the pressure that he now experiences, he is confident God is going to answer his prayer. And so he wraps up the psalm this way. Because he's so confident of the hope that he possesses. This is not an expectation that he has that he hopes the weather is good tomorrow. This is a certainty that he has that he can count on the character of his God in whom he's placed himself. I will also praise you with the harp for your faithfulness, O oh my God. I will sing praises to you with the lyre. Now, you know, the modern application of this, I don't know, the la I guess I heard a harp about five years ago. I don't know the last time I heard a lyre, okay? But I certainly can praise God. My lips will shout for joy in the midst of a tempest. When I sing praises to you, my soul also, which you have redeemed, my security and my identity is not at risk because I know who my God is and what it is that he's done for me. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. My tongue will talk of your righteous help all the day long. 
For they have been put to shame and disappointed who sought to do me hurt. He isn't there yet, but he is so certain that his prayer will be answered in this psalm. He is so certain of the relationship that he's had with God and the relationship that he has with God and the relationship that he will have with God that whatever the tempest is that he's in the midst of now will eventually dissolve because of the grace of God that has been extended towards him. And in the midst of telling that story in the psalm as an opah and sharing that with the congregation, he's passing the torch to another generation. So here's the application. It's a simple one. We can rest in God because of who he is. We can rest in God because of what we have. We can rest in God because of what he has done, is doing, and will do. And we can rest in God because of what he will bring. There is no room for fear in this life for a Christian from the pressure that comes from the world around us. Because he is our refuge. He is our high place. He is our covering. In the meantime, even in the midst of the swirl, we praise him and we pass on the story of what is to come in the hope and the prayer that other people can come to appreciate who God is in the midst of the swirl. So, that's it. The story of an old man who walks with God, who's walked with God much of his life, who understands who God is and what he's about. And in the end, he says this, I can praise God with all my heart and with all my soul and with all my strength and with all my might, and I can love him the same way because he has my back. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for this time, for the encouragement of your word, but more importantly, for the encouragement of your presence. Sometimes the world seems so overwhelming, coming at us from so many directions, with so many challenges, and we can feel small. But you lift us up. Take us into your hands. Wrap your arms around us and place us under your wing and lift us up. May we see and sense that and rest in your goodness and grace. May we tell others and sing your praises. And above all, may we tell our children so that they can see it and know you are a good and gracious God. In the name of our Messiah, Yeshua. Amen. Thank you. I appreciate that. I spoke um, only about a month ago on that same, and there was some new insight. So thank you. Trusting in old age, uh, you're an example to us. Well, <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll just say, wow. <laughs> we can go to the next slide and I'll ask the worship team to come back up. And we will conclude with a couple of songs. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem in Hebrew and then Shabbat Shalom, and I hope you'll sing that with us. And then we'll do something um, that is not unique to us, uh, but we'll ask Daryl, we'll turn off uh, the Zoom guys, and we'll ask Daryl if he wouldn't mind taking some questions. May I encourage you in your own communities to do the same? A few minutes.
Thank you, Ryan. Thank you, Walter. <laughs> Next slide, please. This is the Berkat Kohanim, the priestly benediction out of Book of Numbers, chapter 6. We'll go to the next slide. And if you know it, you can say it with me. Yiparecha Adonai Yishmerecha, Yer Adonai Panafelecha Tifunecha, Yasadonai Panafelecha, Vyasem Lecha Shalom. Amen. Next slide. <laughs> The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turns his face towards you and give you peace. Amen. Next slide. Well, for those of you who are watching online, thank you very much. Until next time, we'll see you in a week. Thank you to everybody that makes contributions to Brit Khadashah. Uh, online as well as physically. Uh, could I ask if you, if it's possible for you, uh, in terms of tonight, uh, would you be so kind to make a contribution, the bags are at the back, uh, for what it's cost us uh, as two ministries. Uh, obviously, we would like to bless Daryl as well. So uh, if you could, it would be much appreciated. Peter has asked me to mention that uh, this afternoon discussion as well as tonight, these things have been recorded. Um, we have uh, your email addresses. We have your email addresses. <laughs> <laughs> so we can forward that to you. Uh, please do everybody a favor and pass it on. It's one of those things that you can pass on with good effect. So thank you very much.